Now, now, today we wanted to talk about viral origins, talking about the SARS coronavirus 2 virus. Where the heck did it come from? And you rumbled this. You were on the ball on this earlier than anyone else, as far as I'm aware. Just tell us what your background is in, in that field of study and why you were able to get to the right conclusion or what I perceive now as the right conclusion so much quicker than as far as I know the rest of the academic medical world. Well this goes back to the fact that there's a lot of research in HIV and I've been working in HIV for a long time and I had I picked up that this obsession with uh, using uh, HIV envelope as the vaccine was completely this is the vaccine for AIDS. For HIV, for AIDS, yeah. AIDS, yeah. It was completely flawed because it had 3,000 antigens in it, which present this to the immune system as an antigen. It's basically just going to get confused. It, it's a decoy, a decoy. Yeah. And the more that we looked and analysed uh, the, the virus, which I got into doing because I found the CD4 as the receptor, which was hailed as a great... Discovery. I don't think it's anything on par of things I've done since. <laughs> but anyway, that got still, me. still pretty good. <laughs> but so the CD4 me. is the receptor on the, the white receptor, cell that the yeah. AIDS virus binds into. Got it absolutely. And just next to it is a region called C5. And we realised that this was probably the Achilles heel of the virus. And we did a lot of work. I mean, this this was over months and years and years. This was no overnight, and it mm-hmm. was by pursuing a lot of avenues and finding it was uh, it, it was a bit like um, Occam's razor that having eliminated absolutely everything out yeah. the agent this was the only thing that stood the test of time and it was the only thing that you didn't make responses to if you did the vaccine because the other things drowned it all out so I realized this was the Achilles heel and I predicted all the failures of the virus, and I was furious because we had uh, all our grant applications turned down by the NIH, which I now realise is Fauci. Fauci didn't understand it. The Gates Foundation, we now know the two of them work, uh, have worked very closely about how things should be funded. Like with, I, I don't believe that if these things were properly peer-reviewed, as we're told they were, that they would have been rejected given how logically we laid it up and because of this and uh, all the work I'd done on this I was contacted through an old PhD student who was working for a company in Norway which was uh, working on an HIV vaccine with the same philosophy get rid of as much as you can go for those conserved elements that if they no longer exist, the virus no longer exists. Get rid of anything that might be a decoy. So we started collaborating. We got very good grants from the Norwegian Research Council together for doing this. The vaccine was very good. Um, It worked very well, but it wasn't as good as we'd like, but nothing is first time round. And I got involved in adapting it to make it even better. And one of the things was to add my the Achilles heel to it. Their HIV vaccine was just based on the core of the nucleus because that's very conserved. So I've added my bit in and it works really beautifully. We've given it a a booster with the IMM 101. So it's really perfect now. And it was going to go and be taken all the way up uh, for registration by a company called Celgene, with whom I've worked with, for, I've worked with them for over 20 years, when I said, you know, thalidomide is a, a drug which is magical, which has been tarred by the birth defect, and, you know, went through that. They were going to pay for the whole thing to go through, so we'd have an HIV vaccine, but unfortunately Celgene were taken over by Bristol-Myers Squibb, which is an enormous pharmaceutical company, who just wanted their cancer agent. So they took them over and threw every other project out, which was, was a tragedy. But however, the bottom line of that was that we, we were working hard together, collaborating, making this vaccine he'd already put into the clinic before I'd met him. And I realised it was the right way to go. I was suspicious of the technology at first. I always am. 
uh, and you always should be. Otherwise, if you take everything for granted, you end up in the mess we are now. <laughs> what way of putting it? Um, so uh, we'd worked really hard on this, and we knew exactly how to do it. And he'd worked with people who had tremendous algorithms, mathematical, for picking out sequences that were really important. And he was far, far ab above, a spot above, all the so-called molecular biologists who just look at sequences. Because he was a biophysicist, he realized that sequences mean nothing until you translate them into amino acids. And amino acids mean nothing until you've built them like a Lego block into a 3D protein. And here they have their own laws. And that was the secret. That's where he was great at. So you could take the sequences and make it even stronger by making sure their charge was correct. All these things, which when I talked to other people, they didn't say, might as well talk over their heads. They, they, they weren't in this league. And so when the COVID sequence came along, the, um, the Berger Sorensen, who is the, the, my big friend and colleague over there, he called me up and he said, Gus, there's going to be a real need for a, a vaccine. Shall we uh, collaborate and go for one along the same lines? And I said, yeah, absolutely. Because I said, before we go any further, this virus has a big spike protein rather like the HIV has an envelope. Mm -hmm. And we know the HIV envelope, using it all was a disaster. I would predict using the whole spike will be a disaster. So we need to pick the bits that are really important. So he said, great, I'll get working on those now with the algorithms and what have you. So one of the first things he did in his team was they did blast analysis, which means you, you take the sequence and the, uh, all the proteins it could possibly make, and you look at the sequences, and the blast analysis showed that 79% of the spike protein had human homology. That meant if you use that 79% of the spike protein, there was going to be a very high chance you were going to induce autoimmune reactions against uh, human epitopes. Can you just unpick a minute what you mean by human homology? Well, it means that the bit of the virus would have a very similar sequence as a very important uh, protein in the human. And we picked out the two who had the strongest homology. One was plate factor four, which uh, means the sequence is near identifying. So by inducing antibodies against this, you would develop a clotting pathway. Um, and uh, serious, it, it would explain the VIIT, the thrombocytopenic uh, condition. I mean, absolutely explain it. This has now been accepted by the authorities as a side effect of the vaccine, albeit very rare and worth it in the long run type of approach. The other was myelin. Now myelin is, you get that attacked, you get uh, transverse myelitis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, etc. So, so myelin is this insulating material around the virtually all nerve fibres. Yeah. Yeah, and that again is exactly what we see. And it's not, it's not a brand new thing because the 1976 flu epidemic in America, the Fort Dietrich one, then that was killing young people. They rushed out a vaccine for it. And they, uh, they were bright doctors and they weren't bullied and they reported back, Guillain-Barre syndrome seems to be much more common since we rolled out these 42 million vaccines. And they looked at this, they sent people out to check it, and they found that it was much more common. And they looked around and they said, but no one's dying of the flu anymore, it's burnt itself out. So they killed the vaccine program. That was Guillain-Barre, it was being caused. It wasn't a COVID vaccine, it was a flu vaccine. So there's, it, it, there's a generic thing between the, the viruses and cross-reactivity with this. Mm. Now we spotted that, so... One of the questions I'd like to ask is why did the 150 other people designing vaccines all go with the whole spike protein? And we shouted and we said, don't do it, don't do it. And because all the lemmings had all decided it was a good idea to jump with the spike protein, we were just ignored and off they go. And every, every vaccine candidate uses the whole spike protein one way or the other. And we had the experience and everything to do that. But we never had the funding properly because the people like the Fauci's and Gates had refused to fund us. So if 79% of the spike protein is the same as human proteins, 
and you make antibodies to that spike protein. That means to me that 79% of those antibodies are going to cross-react with human yes. proteins. Mm -hmm. But you know, they, some of them will be weak and inconsequential. Some of them will be uh, medium and uh, cause all sorts of funny things. You wonder what's going on, like skin reactions and things which have been very common. There's a whole range of weird and wonderful reactions would be due to that. But the one where the homology is very strong, you're going to induce these conditions. And one of the things is they always trumpet, oh, but these side effects are very rare, and in the end they're worth it. Well, if you tell that somebody's paralysed that uh, they didn't get COVID again because it's worth it, 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 it that, 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 to me, that, that was just ridiculously unacceptable when we were warned about it. And they haven't stopped the programme knowing that the instance, this, it's on the MHRA website about Gillian Barre. I mean, so that is not acceptable in young people who are, and, and they're often the ones that get it the, the worst because they've got the strongest immune response uh, to something, um, who've got zero chance of dying of any of these variants. All these variants coming along, there's no evidence at all that they're ever going to be worse than the initial virus, mm. which is why, you know, we're here to talk because it was supremely adapted to infecting and uh, destroying human cells right from the beginning because it had spent years being manipulated in the laboratory in order to do so. Of course, I, I, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. I've always said Guillaume Barry, but... but, but well, <laughs> sure you're right. I, my French was always appalling. No, well, my, my French is non-existent, so yours is clearly better than mine. But it, it can be a devastating disease. I've, I, I've looked after patients for months on intensive care with hypoventilation, paralysis, mm. and again, transverse myelitis. Mm. Transverse means it goes across the spinal cord. Mm. Mm. And again, I've seen people with total paralysis mm. below that level of the lesion, just like in a spinal cord injury. These, are, mm. these can be quite devastating diseases. Now, um, one of the things I think that you noticed early on was, was what you call viral inserts. What did you mean by viral inserts? Right. Well, this goes back to my friend Berger Sorensen, who we're selecting, we're, we're selecting, having decided that 80%, 79% of the spike protein should be avoided at all yeah. costs. Yeah. While putting that into what amino acids are going to be programmed by these sequences. So these are the sequences in the letters of the RNA of the virus. Yes. And we found that when you did that into the amino acids, there were regions where you had amino acids which had a positive charge, say four of them together. Now, this never happens normally because of the as equilibrium goes in. There's a higher level of editing. So you have four amino acids positive. The editing will show that you're going to have two positive, two negative. Yeah. Perhaps three to one is the most extreme, not four. Not four. And it was Berger, who, I mean, I think he was a, a genius uh, of uh, being involved in vaccine design as a biophysicist. He said there are amino acid runs here which uh, shouldn't be here. And I, I discussed them with my colleagues and they said, oh, no, it's all random mutations. It doesn't mean anything. But then we looked that they were all around the receptor binding site and they were all heavily positively charged. Now, I'm no great biophysicist, but I could see what this meant very quickly. And we looked at the, uh, the positive charge of the membrane compared to any other coronavirus or similar virus it was unbelievably high. So this receptor binding domain is the very bit of the spike protein that fits into <laughs> yes. now, the human my, receptors. My uh, analogy, the way I saw it, and I think it's, it's a good way to explain it, is the cell membrane for a virus is rather like the fridge door. So if you hypercharged it up, it's like a magnet. It goes bang and it locks in. That is why it's uh, so supremely adapted to infecting human cells via the ACE receptor. In fact, it's so good, it's even learned to use other receptors. And that was the other thing that came through from that. So 
Berger spotted it with his with his team of, who analysed all the sequences. He spotted that these were positive uh, charge. I went in having spent, you know, I, I, I discovered the receptor in 1984. So even though I was a clinical oncologist, I'd kept my interest in HIV all along and couldn't understand why so many top-class scientists went down so many rabbit holes for years on end. I found that a, a most alarming insight that nobody was as clever as I thought they were you know, when, I, when I started this. But I knew the receptor uh, that I um, was involved in discovering, the CD4, one of the first thing, insights I had was, it's not enough. There's something else required. There's something else required. And we predicted very accurately that it was something else required, but it wasn't discovered for another 10 years. This, is the, this is the HIV transmission yeah, we're talking yeah, about. Well, after I was wandering around the wards, in, <laughs> being, being a cancer doctor. Yeah, again. being a proper doctor, yeah. <laughs> and so, but because of all that insight, I was, you know, I was very well primed to understand Berger. Uh, what what he was doing, and realised he was completely right. And all the people who shouted from the sidelines saying this is all nonsense or rubbish, no, they weren't. I went and looked at papers and read papers, um, and uh, there was a very important paper came out about this time, and it was called on the proximal evidence. It was by a fellow called Christian Anderson, uh, who um, wrote this paper with five or six other top virologists. And it said there's no chance it could have escaped from the lab. That was their constant thing. Uh, I thought that was, after what I'd done with Berger, I thought it was absolutely rubbish. So and done. if you don't agree, you're a conspiracy theorist. If you don't agree, you're a conspiracy theorist. So anyway, I read this paper, and unlike, I would say, the vast majority of people, I actually read their references. You always plough a load of references on the paper, superficially as a decoy to make other people think you know what you're talking about, yeah. that you've read everything. But in actual practice, most of the people who put their names to these things have not read them. So I took it upon myself to read them. And it was beyond belief that they quoted these papers as references mm. because two or three of them were really core. Cool. They were references to bat viruses which had been genetically engineered in Wuhan labs to, for a gain of function or to translate to make them more infectious to human cells yeah. and they described perfectly how they'd done it uh, they had also shown that they'd encouraged them to get even better at this by passaging them that means putting them through all different types of human cells so they take and they adapt and they get more infectious they also virologists uh, are rather amusingly call this polishing <laughs> so <laughs> you polish the virus so it becomes even more adaptable to the cell that it's in. Well, I wish they wouldn't. I wish they wouldn't bother. So, <laughs> so this is like a natural evolution, but accelerated. Yes. It's accelerating the evolution dramatically. So when I looked at these papers, I thought this insert they've just put in, and they've published from a Wuhan lab is exactly the same one that's in the SARS too. You know, and yet they're using this as evidence it didn't come from the lab. So the, the same That's, insert that was yeah. the, 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 the genetic instruction, the letters, yeah. the RNA letters mm -hmm. in the Wuhan publication were the same as the ones that turned up in the virus. Yeah. Yeah. And strangely, I believe the Wuhan database went offline. I believe it was September 2019. Yes, it did. And that's a very important date, the September because just from my personal view and interest in getting interested in COVID, I was able to identify two families who clearly went down with COVID in November. You may were told it didn't come in until December, January. Uh, interesting. They clearly had this, and uh, they had all the classic symptoms. I mean, it was absolute classic. And putting my little detective hat on, I thought, they're miles apart, these two. What do they have in common? What they both had in common was recent visitors from Hong Kong. 
and they got ill after these people came in from Hong Kong. And Hong Kong and Wuhan, you know, they're they're closely connected to yeah. the way like London and Birmingham here. You have always going to have people back and forth. So interesting. So November, made, November yeah. 2019 yeah, in it, the UK. It here then it was here then. Yep. And the, the thing about the um, the importance of September was they were they were very suspicious about something going on. That's why they took it down. It was also interesting that the bat viruses that they were working on, um, which had clearly been harvested from a, a mine a uh, thousand miles away. It's mine. Well, sort of North Thailand area, wasn't it? Yes. And they, they brought them back and they sequenced they did all sorts of things, then they started working on them. They didn't register them in the databases until all this stuff started. Now, that's extremely unusual to do this very late registration of viruses that have been there and you've been working with. That not only made us very suspicious, but also other people suspicious who started to wonder what's going on. And uh, the whole details of these sequences and the evolution history has actually been very well uh, documented by Matt Ridley and his colleagues Lee Shan in their book Viral. They go into that um, part of the evidence extremely well, which I believe is very, very complementary to the way we did it. And then after, with, with the paper I mentioned about this Kirsten Anderson one, the one that uh, we then found that Fauci had commissioned, they were a bit suspicious about being so black and white about it. But once he had that paper published in Nature Medicine, which was submitted and published in five days, something which never happens in a peer-reviewed journal ever. And, you know, in, as soon as it was out, Fauci was waving it around Congress, NIH, here's the proof. And this became embedded. Everybody was told the proof. And anybody who said anything else was a conspiracy theory. Well, it's got to be true because it's in nature. And it's got to be true as in nature. <laughs> so I pointed out with my colleagues that this paper was the most flawed. In fact, I actually said it's the worst scientific paper I've ever come across in my life because normally you have to search hard to find out that the references don't support the ludicrous statements. But this it was glaring in the, that even I could pick it up quickly. That's not bad. <laughs> and nature turned it down and said, we've got nothing against your science, but it's not in the public interest for us to report this. That's what nature told you. That's what they told me. We did the same to Science Journal of Virology, Lancet. They all said exactly the same thing. And sometimes we were rejected within five hours because you can do electronic submission. Within well, it's good to know that the journals have got the public interest at heart, Professor, isn't it? This is just unbelievable yeah, censorship. They, 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 public interest, they don't want the truth out there is the yeah. only conclusion I can come to. And so if they're prepared to do that with something as obvious as the origin of the virus, what are they prepared to do with everything else, uh, the, the, the social in implications, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, drug treatments, vaccines, I think they basically all colluded to lie to us. That's, well, that's my take. You know, we can say I'm uh, confused. Or well, it, 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 come it, to that conclusion. You don't sound confused to me. And if we can't rely on the medical journals, I yes. mean, you know, as, as someone who's, I mean, I, I taught evidence-based practice since it first came out in the 1990s with David Sackett teaching. And, you know, to take away this fundamental axiom of evidence-based medicine, Mm. which is the best available evidence, mm. then we stand on fresh air. We stand on nothing. Yeah, but they even took away the ability to debate it. Yeah. Now, science is all about debate. Yeah. It's not about uh, censoring. And that's why, I mean, I've recently sent a book with colleagues to the press called The Death of Science. Yeah, and looking forward to that. Because I was... Actually, I started writing about the, uh, the tyranny and nonsense and logicality of lockdown. And a friend uh, saw me doing that. I said, what do you think? How should we do it? He said, I've got a lot to add. The next thing we knew, anyway, we were editors. We we're not authors anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, Can't wait to get a copy. When's this yeah, out? It's going to come out very shortly. It's in the printers now, probably in uh, November. In, 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 and, uh, and if you'd like to come on and talk about it, we would be, delight we'd be delighted to hear about it. 
And it was because, you know, when I was writing about lockdown, I said the evidence is all here, but they take no notice of it. This really is the death of science. And my friend said, that's a brilliant title. We're going to use this and I'm going to expand it with you. So that's well, brilliant's one word. I would say tragic or devastating is another word. Mm. Now, the, um, there doesn't seem to be any naturally occurring uh, SARS coronavirus 2 that's ever been found in animal reservoirs or human reservoirs or before the pandemic. Was there any um, immunological evidence of, these, of such a virus? Do you think that is relevant? Well, you, you touched on something. It's not exactly what you asked me, but it actually helps explain very, very well what's going on here. But when we had MERS, the mm -hmm. other cattle, and we had the first... This is 2001, oh, 2003. Yeah, yeah, and then we had the uh, the SARS one. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. And uh, at any rate, one had camel and the other was, was back to civet and things. Yeah, uh, the, the, the MERS was camels and the... Yes, and the SARS, SARS was civet. civet. Yeah. Now, when you had those viruses in the test, you could go back to the area they were found in and you could do serological analysis of everybody being into hospital or their doctor had a blood test. And you could show there were traces there for months in the community while said virus jumped back and forth from back to civet, civet to human or the camel, what's it? And it was doing the polishing. It was getting <laughs> good enough to do, to get infected, to build up a viral load, whereas for the first time the disease become evident. Now, that, that you can find for months. In SARS-2, they couldn't find a single serological imprint uh, uh, around, even around Wuhan or anywhere. They could find absolutely nothing, which meant it had not escaped naturally. It had gone out there full bore, able to infect and cause high viral loads in the first people that went out and, and hit. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, in previous outbreaks, we've been able to find multiple outbreaks at multiple yes. times. Mm -hmm. So if, if the virus becomes endemic in a human or an animal population, then the animals could spread out over 10 miles, 100 miles, several hundreds of miles. Mm -hmm. There'd be zoonotic transfer here, then there'd be zoonotic transfer in Carlisle, and zoonotic transfer in London, and zoonotic transfer in John O'Groats, mm -hmm. and we would get... Out, different outbreaks at different times. We didn't see that. We yeah. saw a single outbreak. Mm. Is that significant as well? Well, I, I, I think it's highly significant. There may well have been um, uh, two or three seedings uh, in different populations with slightly different takes, but they all at the same time, they, I believe they all came from the same laboratory. Mm specimen and they found some of the feet first people to get infected were people actually involved in mixing the soups of these viruses and the other thing i could not understand is when we pointed out it has to be a lab leak was the fact no these labs are too good they can't possibly escape when we could find six reports in the standard literature six detailed reports of the sars virus having escaped from laboratories, one in Taiwan, one in Singapore, four from China. This is the original SARS-2003. This was meant to be highly contained by, uh, laboratories. And the other thing that um, was very clear from a previous inspections of Wuhan was the, the level of uh, uh, security. Mm. Uh, it was very, very poor for a laboratory working mm -hmm. So it meant that escape was inevitable in mm -hmm. my in my book. So why should they cause such a fuss about it? it couldn't possibly escape? And anything to say, well, I'm a great believer in the, I, I call it the, the, uh, the first uh, Dalglish law of universal human incompetence. Yeah. <laughs> I subscribe to that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> human incompetence is far more likely than, than any sort of malign intent. It may be behind it, but usually what you end up dealing with is a piece of human incompetence. Yeah. Which was so, the same with the, the foot and mouth outbreak too. By yeah, way. yeah. So the, the three options for the viral origin are natural zoonotic, mm. uh, accidental lab leak or deliberate lab leak. And yes. I think I'm with you, accidental lab leak. So... That's uh, that's that's where I came from. That this was a uh, a lab leak 
And the problem was they tried to cover it up. Yeah. Instead of coming clean, and here is something really, really nasty and sinister. They actually got the WHO mm. into going along with them trying to cover it up. Mm. If the WHO had been under the previous aegis of the, mm. the previous head, whose name just escapes me, uh, who was not under the control of China like uh, mm. Tedros uh, was, um, and who should never have been head of WHO. He wasn't even a medic. He was put in there for political reasons. He did what he was told. Shut up, didn't do it. Had they done their job, this would never have escaped to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, talking to lots of people involved in these things, I completely believe that. So it would I have been contained in Wuhan area, in Wuhan. Hubei area. Yeah, and it would, it would never have got outside China. Stop so, the flights from China. And the, the, the WHO at the time specifically said we should carry on flying in and out of China. I, even at that time, I was bemused. That was madness. It is clear, clear, obvious madness. But the real sinister thing here is that the WHO said in order to handle this better next time, we need all the powers yep. assigned to us. That is, I would rather sign, sign a suicide pact with yep. the <laughs> I know UK. Well, but never let a good crisis go to waste, Professor. <laughs> well, hopefully we've got to May next year uh, to come to our senses. But uh, I, I don't hold out much hope. The people who seem to run and advise these things seem to be the most inappropriate people. And the mm -hmm. government seems to be so poorly uh, educated and so intellectually lazy. They go along with all this. Yep. And we, we have done several videos on that. People like James Roguski, who's done absolutely sterling work on that. Now, I keep getting questions on this. I've never fully understood it. How similar, how homologous are SARS coronavirus 2 sequences with the HI virus? With the which virus? The human immunodeficiency virus. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the HIV sorry. virus. Sorry, yeah, sorry. yeah. Yeah, I got told off once. A, a virologist uh, uh, told me off. He says, I said, the HIV virus. He said, how can you have the HIV virus virus? <laughs> so, so since then, I've always tried to say HIV virus. But, oh, yeah. I, I, I've, always, I've always just say HIV. Yeah. There is very, very little homology. But okay. there is a tiny little bit of uh, homology. And this bit of homology is real. But I think we've discovered why it's there. When I mentioned about how they, they get their bat viruses and they train them to infect human receptors, they put the human ACE receptor into a cell, a, 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 a neutral cell, with an HIV lentivirus. So the virus takes the receptor in, it gets integrated up, and then it gets expressed on the cell that would never normally present it. Those little HIV sequences, were the, it was an HIV lentivirus. So when you look at the sequences, you're picking up the sequences from the vector the ACE, the ACE receptor was introduced to the cell with. The virus has picked them up. So the homology is really, there's nothing to do, there's no, there's no link with the two. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but those sequences, to me, absolutely confirm that it was not only genetically engineered, but it was heavily passaged through that. But that and that's because of that passaging, it's picked up those HIV sequences. But that's, pure, that's purely all it is. There's no big homology with the two. Right, good. Now, my last question is, I've only ever partly understood this. Um, there's a furin cleavage site on the spike protein of the virus. And furin is a protein on the surface of human cells. Mm -hmm. Now, this furin cleavage site, I kind of think of it as kicking over, kicking open these furin doors mm -hmm. to allow the, the virus into the cell so it can reproduce. So is that kind of vaguely right? And what is the significance of finding the furin cleavage site on the spike protein? The significance of the furin cleavage site on, uh, on the spike protein of the SARS and MERS virus group is it's never ever been there any of these viruses whatsoever, ever. 
So, However, so, so just to clarify that, sorry, the, the, the MERS and the SARS coronavirus 1 don't have a furin cleavage site? No, no, neither do any within that phylogeny of the coronaviruses from which these viruses have so been... So SARS coronavirus 2 is the only coronavirus that we yes. know of with a yes. furin cleavage site? Uh, it, it, of, the, of the sort that can infect man? Yes. There are some uh, animal uh, coronaviruses, which my virology friends keep proudly telling me do have furin cleavage sites, but they don't infect us. This Got is it. the only one that does. Now, the furin cleavage site was put into these bat cells by people in the Wuhan lab because they boasted about it, that they did it. These same people, when they presented the sequence of the virus in nature, the furin cleavage site is screaming in plain sight. They discuss everything else about the sequence, but they don't discuss the furin cleavage site. They now, probably forgot. Oh, that's well, very kind. Of. <laughs> they forgot they put it in there. Now, you couldn't make this up, could you? No. And what a furin cleavage site uh, does is, is basically when you, if you have a virus getting onto the cell, you can lock on pretty tight, but you have to work pretty hard to get through the cell membrane. But a furin cleavage site is like giving the virus an extra pair of scissors. <laughs> so I can just slip through and get into that very, very quickly. That, was, that never occurs in this type of virus. Uh, it was put there in the Wuhan lab. And it was they who, uh, uh, it's like magic, you know, sleight of hope. You don't see it there, but you had to look very carefully. And my uh, colleagues picked it up um, and pointed it out. And then we found that other people had pointed it out. Uh, David Baltimore was a famous virologist. He said it's very odd. He called it the smoking gun. Mm. And this, this went as far as the Washington Post and this, that. And it was all dismissed as... Uh, um, nonsense of no importance and then another load of virologists come up and said well some viruses have these which is true but not the sort of viruses we're dealing with infecting humans it's completely irrelevant it's like and, saying some animals have trunks but yeah, humans exactly. don't exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes. and you know then the other thing about this they they tried so hard to say oh um, to, to go against our, our discussions here which other people joined uh, slowly they said, oh, but we found this virus is present in a raccoon or so, this, that and the other. So it came from the raccoon. So that they look around, all the raccoons know this, this is the only one. It could be a false positive. And you get papers coming. There was a paper from, uh, say, a city in Scotland, which tried desperately hard to open up the narrative that okay, it was a natural jump, what have you. Mm. And uh, I... By this time, I know how to do my science. I just looked at their funding. China. <laughs> it's ridiculous. They don't even have to go to the referee. First scientific analysis is these, these days. Who the heck paid for this? Who, who is funding? And unfortunately, it's even more important uh, when you get into treatments and vaccines. Yeah. I don't want to get into that now, but, <laughs> but do, uh, the, the reason I'm so concerned about the viral origins... Is, is it possible that humans could be jiggery-pokering around with a virus which is as transmissible as, say, measles or an Omicron virus, mm -hmm. but as deadly as, say, an Ebola virus? Is, is such a thing possible? Yes, it is. And this is all called the gain of function. And this is what, under the Obama administration, they banned. And uh, the scientists, and I've got uh, a colleague I know myself, basically... He calls all virology gain a function in the desperate attempt to try and uh, preserve it. No, it is, I mean, the sort of thing that was being done was absolutely mad. Uh, it was basically, it was inevitable that a pandemic would arise out of this nonsense. Obama and people banned it, but they tried to get an exception. And who was the person who tried to get the exception? And that was Anthony Fauci, uh, in order to uh, have things in case something dreadful came along. Uh, very exceptional cases. Well, he wasn't allowed to do it in his own place. So he funded this work to be done in Wuhan via the Eco Health Alliance, via a Peter, person called Peter Dazak, who is very, very friendly with Batwoman, who uh, is the woman who, uh, whose lab did this very manipulation that, uh, that led to it uh, coming out. Uh, uh, to escaping. So when Fauci went to these extreme lengths to deny this, 
I immediately knew he was covering his backside over this, but he realised he was in trouble. So whereas initially I blamed the Chinese, uh, for which I was called by some people a racist, I don't know how when you actually point out that something comes from somewhere, you're a racist for pointing it out. But when I trace everything back, if somebody has to take the rap for this, it has to be Fauci. He's, to me, he is the one single person guilty. He's just used his excessive, outrageous power, an mm. unbelievable war chest, to uh, bribe and get what he wants. And I use bribe uh, succinctly and uh, uh, clearly because of the Kirsten Anderson, who wrote that ludicrous paper for him, that he got uh, mm. the narrative, the nature. Yeah. immediately got a, a, a nearly $9 million grant to carry on his work in his institute, which did not go out to peer review in all the normal sentences, uh, circumstances, according to my sources. And well, so, just another bizarre temporal correlation, isn't it? And, and the same happened with Gaza. The same happened with Dazzle. They wrote a letter to the Lancet saying this is absolutely ludicrous. Anything that suggests it came out uh, of, uh, of China lab is, and I, I, they used the word it was racist and didn't mean it. God, everything else, 26 people signed it. No conflict of interest was declared. 25 of 26 of those people were all funded directly or indirectly by that uh, charity. And they now, a lot of them have come out and they want to withdraw it. They realise they have been who Why that paper has not been withdrawn, I have no idea. It's just uh, if you told me it had been withdrawn, I would have expected it. But the fact it's still not, yeah. they're still arguing amongst themselves. Just un unbelievable. So, is existential means existence? Mm. I I is is a future lab leak potentially an existential threat to to humanity? Yes, I think it is, and I think all this work should be stopped. Whatever anybody says. Um, because it really does get rather circular, all this thing. Is they, they say we have to do this, so we have the tools and understanding to make drugs and vaccines for the next pandemic, which will surely arise. Well, we now know we would not have had uh, the SARS-CoV uh, pandemic had they not been doing this research and also doing it so badly and sloppily and incompetently under uh, an auspices of things like the WHO, where they're the most unfit people to uh, have done this. And they should be removed. I think the WHO should be defunded. Uh, I really do. And start again. It's so corrupt. Yep. So is Garvey. So is CEPI. All these organisations which managed to suck hundreds of millions of dollars from the UK government on the grounds we're doing our part, protecting the world, this, that and the other. But all it's doing is, is enhancing corrupt incompetence in my book. And people like myself and Berger have been unable to get even the morsels of this when we actually have come up with, I mean, if we'd had our IMM and our two or three uh, special core bits of the vaccine, there'd have been no side effect profile of anything like we're dealing with now, and uh, we would not have had the variants. Yep. Just, so what's the I I -N -M? I -M -M one oh one. It, it, it I M. I M N, yeah. Yeah, I M M stands yeah. for Imodulin uh, yeah. Dash One Hundred One. That was the strain, so that's how it stuck. Right. Cool. Uh, uh, Imodulin is the company that makes it and is doing the trials. They're a very small company, and they've got a website, so people can look at that, etc. Yep. And uh, as we've said on the on the previous uh, the start of this talk or the previous video, this is uh, safe and effective. Mm. And it is not systemically distributed. It will stay in the arm and the. Well, it doesn't. It, it doesn't need to because it does go to the lymph node. Yeah. And back again, and that's all it needs to. Yeah, and it's the lymph nodes yeah. that do all the clever stuff. Yeah, really. it sensitizes everything. It doesn't go anywhere. It's dead. It can't. Yeah. Unlike the messenger RNA, it cannot yeah. go anywhere. It's dead. Yeah. It's it gobbled up by macrophages, and then that's the end of it. Absolutely, the the way that the immune system uh, desires, it's uh, quite now, an ama amazing system. With regards to you know the origins, I would like to take the opportunity to Please. say that right at the beginning, there was a brave uh, Italian journalist, and there was also an Australian journalist who basically started asking very good questions about this. And one of them was Paul uh, Paolo Bernardo, who is like uh, an insight person in uh, Italy. And he interviewed me at great length and many other people at great length and at any rate put out a book in Italy in which uh, he asked me to write 
the, my version of the origins, and also Stephen Key, who was the, uh, I mean, basically he's a mathematician, statistician, and a quantum analysis person, mm -hmm. who basically presented to Congress, he was the first to convince them and said, all my analysis says this came from the lab, and I set out to do it. So, first of all, we published this book, you can see that, can you? It's in Italian. Oh, yeah. It's in Italian. Yep. It, did, it did very, very well. And then they said we wanted to translate it to English. And uh, that's it there. See, it's called yep. The Origin of the Virus. I'm uh, one of three authors of it. Stephen Key's there. Now, for people who really want to know better, you can see it's a sort of a paper yep. back book. It's, uh, it's, it's quite short. We try to make it as concise and easy for people to follow. Where can it, I get a copy? You, you, you can get it off uh, the, the Amazon Kindle very easily. And we'll, we'll, put, we'll put the it, link to that. It sold, uh, it sold tens of tens of thousands of uh, copies over that uh, thing. And it's done, it's done very well mm -hmm. from, from the point of view, the fact that nobody would stock it and nobody would review it. And so so uh, it, you know, that, that was what we were up to. In those. They still wouldn't review it. They wouldn't stock it in bookshops. And they, none of my, even people who asked me to write for them, even they wouldn't review it because they were, you know, this was part of you're not allowed to. This is now moved on to you're not allowed to criticise the vaccine things. This is kind of same suppression thing. But, you know, show you how even-handed I am about all this. That, you know, this is the book Viral by Matt Ridley. Oh, yeah. Miss Chan. Now, a little I, to your right. Move a little yeah. to your right. Is that, is that, yeah, 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 yeah. You can see that. Yeah. Now, this book is very, very complimentary because they go in for, for all the, the history and the emails and the, the databases, etc. It's a it, timeline. Re timeline, very, very good. But it, it goes and points out that um, if it hadn't been some brave souls in China, we would never have had the sequence because they wanted to keep the sequence to to get their own vaccine and things like that from it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, it's very complimentary. But the two together, I think that the any idea that this was a natural virus, is weird, you would, couldn't possibly even retain the notion of it. And the fact that it was in this lab, being engineered, and was, there was so much covert work going out on it, and everything, and the funding was actually enormous. I think is really very well covered in that book. You're aware of that one? I am. Yeah, I've never read it, but yeah, yeah. I would recommend you read it. Uh, Again, we'll, we'll put the links to that. The real Anthony Fauci, because that explains why they were doing all this game of function work in Wuhan in the first place. I mean, it all seems to be part of they wanted to have a big um, industrialised medical uh, complex to produce vaccine after vaccine for the coming pandemic. And the coming pandemic was actually the title of a book that Bill Gates wrote in 2015. And it's unbelievably spot on. And so sometimes you can set out to try and do something, do good uh, in, in your perception and put all the infrastructure in place and end up causing the various th very thing that you were trying to prevent in the first place, which would not have occurred if you hadn't tried <laughs> to engineer all, all this thing. So that's my frustration by all this. It really is. They would be much better looking at the sort of things that um, uh, we were doing, like what I would call a, a pan P cell vaccine mm. for all viral infections, then you wouldn't have to go through all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, stun, stunning, uh, stunning stuff, Professor Dalglish. Thank you so much for coming back on. Um, and if it's any compensation at all, there's, there's tens of thousands of people out there who are uh, agreeing with everything you say on the comments, and they're just so relieved mm. that, that someone of your caliber is is um, expressing scientifically what what people like me and a lot of the viewers simply don't have the scientific background to do. But you've put that eloquently and brilliantly i've understood it even so it, it's, it must be pretty good and uh thank you and of course um anytime you want to come back on certainly we'd like to know more about this death of science book 
Yes, I, um, I, I don't have it with me at the moment because it said it's at with the publishers, but it has been, uh, it's, it's done it's all its editing, what have you. I'm pleased to say that I'm not the author of it, although I did write uh, three chapters in it. And then my colleague, Paul Goddard, who'd actually specialised in pandemics and written a book called The Pandemic. So that's yeah. why we were very, very well aligned to write this. Yeah. Looking, then looking we expanded, and expanded it with yeah. lots of people who had their unique insights to put to it. So it's a really considerable tone. And I was delighted that uh, my uh, uh, two colleagues, um, Carol Sikora, has given it a, a, a great clinical uh, introduction. And Sir Richard Dearlove has written a fantastic prologue as to... Former head of the um, intelligence ex services. MI6 and in intelligence services. And mm -hmm. he's written a fantastic prologue which encapsulates uh, philosophically everything that we have been trying to say and what it means. It really is brilliant. And uh, so even for that, I recommend. <laughs> I, I just hope we're not heading into a anti-scientific or controlled scientific dark age dystopian era i'm afraid we've already descended down where, where we, we don't have access to truth yeah i'm afraid i'm afraid we're already there we've already descended down the first tunnel uh one of the reasons for writing this book is to try and wake everybody up as to what's happening and of course it's you're getting there's a multiple attack from uh, the, what i call the the wokies <laughs> which are destroying universities. They're absolutely destroying the universities. You cannot believe it. It's you're not allowed to uh, investigate things unless the, these people deem it as, uh, as uh, you know, well, okay, I just don't know the, the words to do. But at any rate, they are straight out of 1984, basically changing all the words for everything. So suddenly inclusive and diversity, etc. all that means that certain groups of people are excluded. Yeah. <laughs> and the knowledge is controlled by other groups of people. Yeah. This is what's going on in the universities. It's really, really frightening what's going on. Well, I, I want knowledge to be controlled with people like you that have spent a lifetime mm -hmm. studying this, saving multiple people's lives throughout your career. And um, you know, you, you've, got, you've got the academic ability and the practical medical skills and... You know, not to listen to people like you, to me, would seem tantamount to poking yourself in the eye with a needle. But why on earth wouldn't you listen to our experts? Well, this, this is my, I could just need to put across, this Please. is my frustration, a complete nice frustration. I mean, right at the beginning, we had access to people in the cabinet and Gove and Witty. Um, and we told them all this, we gave them all the papers. But they all came back and said it's uh, decided it's not that important. I mean, just simple things I mentioned last time, like the vitamin D. We mm. got a thing back. Chris Whitty says there's not enough evidence. They really had a hundred, hundred papers. Uh, not enough evidence. But suppose there wasn't enough evidence, and there was only. Uh, I mean, we know vitamin D is effective, but suppose there wasn't much evidence, and supposing there was only a chance it was maybe ten percent effective. The mm. point is, it's safe. Exactly. Why not? They lost, they lost complete control of proportionality. Yeah. There was no proportionality in handling of this virus. Yeah. And there, there should have been... I mean, I now know, looking at the, the members of SAGE, I mean, we thought they'd been put together because they were clever and knew what they're doing. I wouldn't look, let them look after a dog's home, most of them. I mean, they're totally, utterly... Uh, inappropriate for dealing with this so they were in, into their modeling worst case scenarios or social things and what have you i mean and then when we went into it we started listening to them talking like debbie shravenka from uh, edinburgh she was always on the media as a social epidemiologist i mean she was saying things he couldn't possibly justify as if it was fact and it turned out she was the main um, advisor to sturgeon so no wonder they wanted uh, everything all locked down and masks and everything like that. There was no evidence for any of that whatsoever. And, and they've, now, they've now acknowledged the evidence was the, the term the government are now using is weak. Well, why didn't they? I mean, people like us were telling them it was weak right from day one. As you know, from the, the lockdown, I said, the lockdown is madness. The, the side effects of lockdown will be worse than any uh, possible benefit, which I saw none. 
because one of the worst things about lockdown, actually, you prevented natural transmission. Yeah. You still herd immunity. Yeah. Uh, and they, they... Or, or w widespread immunity during a period of endemicity yeah. anyway. Uh, so that, that was, to me, was the worst thing, was they completely ignored people like me. And I thought perhaps it was because people often just say, oh, he's a maverick, you know, he's mad, he does things that nobody else does. I take that as a compliment. <laughs> but I found there were other people saying the same thing. And I mentioned this before, David Grimes, David Anderson, also submitted great documents that all you have to do is get this low vitamin D up and then the... Uh, uh, the um, counter, uh, what's, what's the word, friendly fire, whatever it is, effect of the virus on people will, will be completely yeah. attenuated. You don't need yeah. it. Yeah, the, 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 inflamm the inflammatory immunological yeah. reaction that caused yeah. the yeah. acute respiratory yeah. distress syndrome. Yeah. So, uh, that, that's, that's, so when I found that others were saying the same thing, but we were all being dismissed as, oh, you know, we're old people, we don't know what we're talking about. Funnily enough, lifetime of medicine you do actually get a fantastic insight into what works, as you know. You really do. And the poor young doctors are being basically indoctrinated yeah. in stuff that, you know, I go in and tell them what's true. When, uh, when I was uh, allowed to, to teach medical students, apparently because I refused to go on a course to be indoctrinated into gender and all this sort of stuff, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, given the approval. When I did... I used to tell them that they had to listen carefully and stay awake because when I was a medical, medical student, half of what I was told in these dogmatic lectures turned out to be absolute rubbish. And <laughs> I said, it is likely half of what I'm going to say now it may well turn out to be absolute rubbish. It's your job to listen and weigh up the evidence and continually interpret it. That's, that's what it's all about. And then I would get people say... And I was trying to work, say why something was so important and so interesting. And I'd get someone put their hand up and I'd say, uh, please, sir, this isn't in our, our uh, um, curriculum. We don't need to know this. These are doctors at university. Can you imagine how I feel? I mean, so this rot started a long time ago. It started when the educators, uh, we, we got whole divisions, departments of education and educators started to determine who could teach uh, the students, uh, who was competent to teach students, i.e. not me, and who was, i.e. people who'd done a course and didn't know what they were talking about, <laughs> but they were allowed to do this. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Mm. Professor, thank you very much, for taking okay. up a lot of your time. Right. Um, I, I'm just... Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm stunned. I'm stunned. I'm, I'm going to have to process that and listen to that a couple of times. It's okay. amazing stuff. Thank, you, thank you so much. If you want the details of my stuff, I did write, write my bit about the sequences and the charge and everything and where all the bits came from and the papers in there. Yeah. And uh, friends who know nothing about uh, virology sequences or anything have told me that they understood exactly what I was getting at. And I say for anybody who doesn't really want to cope with that, read Stephen Key, who just basically assimilates the facts as they were and, and uh, puts them through Bayesian analysis yeah. uh, and just reiterates till he comes out and says it's impossible yeah. for it to have come from an actual. So the two together are fantastic. Yeah. And Paolo basically goes through um, how he started to investigate it and realise that people were being uh, silenced and clamped down and the yeah. truth was not getting out. This so is, it's a very good read. Yeah, this is the major tragedy of this, the, the silencing of uh, opposing voices. The, uh, the, the thesis, thesis antithesis mm. development of science is now no longer allowed, in, at least in certain areas, and it's... Um, well, I mean, the, the, the one thing that... Um, were, the things that um, I was always taught that I uh, worked out was uh, told how to work things. I mentioned one of them was Occam's razor. Mm. I mean, no one really seems to use that. And the, the other is sort of the, the null hypothesis yeah. uh, too. You know, you actually decide something's null hypothesis. And then there's the other one that's just escaped my mind. If everything fits perfectly, uh, you probably spring to you. 
you have to realize that that is just using A plus B equals C. Mm. It's completely outside all the other factors in the environment that lead to signaling. And that's a major thing that we need to understand for cancer. It's just the uh, Heisenberg principle. Mm. That's the Heisenberg principle. And that's very much to me in cancer. You can work out all these lovely little oncogenic pathways all you like and you think you can fully understand it, but you've got to step back and realize you've worked out what's going inside a cell, inside a tumor with multiple components, which is governed by the tumor microenvironment. So this is what seems to be missing in science. It, all, it gets so reductive yeah. that they, they miss, they can't see the wood for the trees. They just go on about the trees mm -hmm. and they don't see the wood. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Professor. And uh, if you'd like to come back on again, of course, you're welcome absolutely any time. And we'll put the links to those. Yeah, I'd love to come back on when the book's released. Oh, we'll, we'll be more than delighted. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. Bye. Thank you. Bye.